Yes, I am. Okay, let me just give a word of introduction. I think Etienne needs no introduction, but in case there are people on the Zoom that do not know him, I want to say just a few words about uh, Etienne. So he comes to us from the great country of France, uh, from the city of Dijon, that famous mustard capital of the world. Uh, he did his work in, uh, uh, in Grenoble, uh, working with Rob Whitney uh, for his PhD, and then came to the United States uh, three years ago now? Yes. Working with me uh, first at the University of Rochester and now uh, working, well, uh, up until recently, working remotely with me here at Chapman. And Etienne is an expert in the physics of uh, quantum thermal uh, dynamics and machines. Uh, and today he'll be talking to us about some work we did together with our uh, friends in France uh, and in St. Louis about many body quantum vacuum fluctuation. So uh, at the end, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone. So I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's actually the first time I come to this room, even though I've attended many like, seminars online from Rochester. Um, yeah, so I wish I could have stayed in Chapman more. <laughs> so yeah, um, as Andrew said, I'm going to talk about um, our recent work on, on many body quantum vacuum fluctuation engines. So when you hear about uh, quantum vacuum fluctuations, um, the first thing that comes to mind to me is the harmonic oscillator and how the quantum case is, is different from the classical case. And so the main reason for that, of course, is, uh, as everybody knows, in, in quantum mechanics, position and momentum do not commute. And for the harmonic oscillator, it means that you cannot minimize at the same time the kinetic and potential energies. And that's what gives rise to what's called the zero point energy, the fact that in the ground state, the, the, the harmonic oscillator still has some energy, contrary to the classical case where the minimum energy is zero. And, and that also means that uh, position and momentum will fluctuate uh, in this ground state. So if you try to measure position or momentum, you, will, you may find that it's not zero. So on average, it's zero, but you still have fluctuations. And uh, a consequence of that uh, has to do with the electromagnetic field. When it's quantized, uh, you, it can be seen as a collection of harmonic oscillators. And so all of these harmonic oscillators um, will uh, experience vacuum uh, ground state fluctuations, uh, quantum fluctuations. And so it means that even if you're in the vacuum of photons, you don't have any photons in, in, the, uh, in a box or, or in, that in the space you are interested in, um, you may still measure um, uh, some electric electromagnetic field. Uh, you have these fluctuations. And these vacuum fluctuations of, these, of the electromagnetic field are very important uh, to understand, for example, the physics of uh, atom and photon interactions. Uh, a striking example of that is a spontaneous emission that you cannot understand if you don't quantize the, the, the magnetic field, the electromagnetic field. And so some people actually say that a spontaneous emission can be thought of as um, emission which is stimulated by um, vacuum fluctuations. And similarly, uh, you will have some uh, uh, lamp shift in the hydrogen atom spectrum uh, due to these vacuum fluctuations. So it's very important. Um, and, and another uh, consequence, which is fairly well known uh, about these vacuum fluctuations, is the Casimir effect. So I'm guessing most people have already heard of that. Uh, the idea is, uh, I mean, it's very simple to describe. If you have two metallic plates uh, in the vacuum of the electromagnetic field, the, the fluctuations of the electromagnetic field, the vacuum fluctuations, uh, will give rise to a, to a force that uh, um, an attractive force between the plates, so they will get closer together. And people had ideas to harness these fluctuations to produce useful work, work for quite a while. So here, uh, at the bottom right, you have like this kind of slinky looking um, uh, aluminum uh, foil uh, uh, thing, which was proposed by forward in, in the 80s. And, and this is supposed to be uh, a vacuum fluctuation battery. So the idea is that if you plug that thing to, to a power supply, uh, you will charge all, all the, the, the different foils. And that will give rise to a 
a, um, a small repulsive force between each foil. And now the idea is to tune that repulsive ele electrostatic repulsive force so that it's slightly smaller than uh, the Casimir force. And so the, the, the foils will get closer together. Uh, and this is acting against the electro electrostatic repulsion. And so that will produce some work. And so they say it's a battery because then if you increase slightly the electrostatic repulsion um, uh, to, to have it slightly bigger than the Casimir force, the, the slinky will, will extend again. And basically you have recharged your battery, they say, they say. So you can use it later to do what I've just described. Uh, but here uh, we have different ideas on how to accept uh, access to these vacuum fluctuations. And our idea is linked to uh, something which has been very prominent in, in recent years, which are measurement engines. So we have all uh, learned from textbook thermodynamics how a uh, heat engine work. So basically you extract heat from a hot reservoir and your system, which can be like this big locomotive here, will transform it into useful work so the locomotive can move. And there has been a lot of uh, new proposals recently, which are very useful for quantum technology uh, about replacing that hot reservoir by a measurement apparatus. That's because if you measure a quantity, an observable that does not commute with the energy, uh, you may not end up in a state of same energy. So your measurement apparatus may actually uh, bring some energy to your system and you can use this energy uh, to perform some useful work. So I just want to highlight uh, some works that have been done on this topic uh, by former members of Professor Jordan's team. So especially we have this uh, seminal paper by, by Cyril Eluard and, and Professor Jordan, where uh, you have these two proposals, which are quite cool, the single atom elevator and the single electron battery. So for the single atom elevator, you imagine an atom, which is in the gravitational field. And um, since, since uh, because of quantum mechanics, the wave function is quite it is somewhat spread out, and so you may measure uh, the atom. You may if you perform like a weak measurement close to the to the bottom of the, the that plate that, that's here, uh, you may find that the atom is not here, which means that you can uh, elevate that plate. You can put the uh, uh, go up with the plate uh, without having to spend any energy. And the idea for the single electron battery is uh, more or less the same, uh, except that now you replace the uh, gravitational field with an electric field uh, for a charged particle, and you can move um, this uh, plate here uh, to the left. On a slide, so uh, on another uh, idea, you have uh, down there this work by, by uh, Srinath, Manikandan and, and Cyril Delvoir again, um, about this quantum oscillator engine, which is fueled by incompatible measurements. So if you measure both the position and, and, uh, and the momentum of, of the oscillator, you may end up find a state with a higher energy and that may allow you to move the harmonic trap that you have here, doing some work in the process. So, all the things I've talked about, like these proposals that I've shown before, were only involving uh, one parquet system on which measure measurements were performed. And um, I want to quickly talk about uh, this work here, which uh, is from about a year ago, uh, which was mainly, uh, so it's from the uh, team of Alexia Ofer in, in France, in Grenoble, France, in collaboration with people here. and. Uh, Kater uh, Merch in St. Louis. Uh, and here you see that it, it is a two qubit system on which measurements are performed. So the main point is that, so you start with these two qubits up here. Uh, the one which has a small transition frequency is excited and the other one which has a bigger transition frequency is, is in its ground state. And they are entangled, so they have this interaction G. And you let them, uh, uh, you let the free evolution take place. And uh, if you time measurement on, on the atom with a big transition frequency, right, you may find it in uh, an excited state. And then it means that if you, so that's what, what's on the right here. And, and by performing a swap operation, you can recover some energy. Um, and, and, uh, and then you end up in the initial situation and the, start of the, the cycle can start again. 
And so, yeah, the key point here is that you have some entanglement between the uh, qubits, and so you have excitations that can go from one to the other. And so we want to combine all of this uh, in the work we're doing here. And our idea is to have a quantum vacuum powered engine with local measurements. And so uh, we, we are interested in the case where you have um, strongly interacting quantum systems, which become entangled. And especially we're interested in the case where you have an entangled ground state. This means that when you're in the ground state and if it's entangled, the local description breaks down and you will have vacuum fluctuations of, of local observables. And our idea is to access these fluctuations by performing measurements on each subsystem. So that's what we call local measurements. And, and that might uh, help uh, doing so we can, we may end up in a state of higher energy, which we can then uh, extract through um, local operations. So let me uh, introduce a little bit more the notations and, and the formalism that we will use. Uh, so we are interested in models like the one up here, where uh, the Hamiltonian for the many body system we are considering can be decomposed into two parts, the local part, which we call the local part, and the interaction part. The, lo the local part here is the sum of all these hj's. Um, it's really just one body terms. And we assume that uh, we can have a, usually in most cases, uh, it's fairly easy to, um, to obtain the local eigenstates which diagonalize this local Hamiltonian. We denote them by L and they are just, um, they are just uh, like product states of uh, what happens for every subsystem. And in particular, uh, what we are in, uh, it's important, we introduce a, specific notation for the local ground state, so zero lock here, which will be important in, in, um, in the future. Uh, but because of the interaction, which up here we wrote as a sum of pro, uh, interaction operators for, for each subsystem, uh, basically you have this product of interaction operators uh, that compose the interaction, the, the total system will become entangled. And so the actual, the total ground state uh, is, is entangled here and we denote, we denote it by uh, zero tilde. Uh, and uh, so an important quantity uh, that I introduced and that is very fundamental to our work is what we call the local entang entanglement gap, delta, which is the energy difference between that uh, local ground state energy and the <clears throat> entangled ground state energy. And it's always more than zero. This is related to, to the concept of entanglement gap, which is um, the energy gap between the separable state with the lowest energy and the actual ground state, which is why we coined this term local entanglement. And one point, one final point I want to make for, uh, for, for, for uh, this engine is that we require that all the expectation values for the interaction operator, so the size up here, are zero in the local basis. And that means, so uh, that the expectation value of the interaction Hamiltonian will be zero in these spaces. This is very important because that means that we can switch on and off the, um, the interactions when uh, we are in this local basis. Uh, so yeah, that's a little illustration of what I've just told with notations and everything. So on the right with the red color, you have the energy levels for the total Hamiltonian where you have interactions and the ground state is called zero tilde. And on the left in green, you have uh, just the energy levels for the local Hamiltonian, so local eigenstates. And uh, yeah, the local ground state has a higher energy than the total ground state. And we have this energy gap delta. So now let me show you how the cycle we designed work. Uh, so we start with the system in its entangled ground state. And now we perform a measurement of its local state. So we, we perform basically measurements on each uh, subsystem to obtain, so yeah, in the energy eigenbasis to obtain the, what we call the local state. So uh, some state L. So if you're unlucky, you just happen to be in the, in the local ground state. But if you have some, some luck, you can be in a, a local yeah, be luck. Uh, this is a projective measurement, right? Yeah, this is a projective measurement. Thank you for, uh, for uh, yeah. 
We do a project measurement, indeed. Uh, so you may end up in, in a local excited state, as, a, as I uh, showed it here. And so we are now we are uh, we know that our system is in the, lo the local basis. And I've told you before that uh, we choose system for which the interaction Hamiltonian has a, a zero expectation value in this basis, which means that we can turn off uh, oh, sorry, interactions at no cost. Uh, so now we uh, we are in in the left part of the of the screen where where uh, you don't have any interactions, and in this case you can manipulate. Um, so uh, you have to assume that you have sufficient control manipulation on the local part of the Hamiltonian so that you can recover all the excess energy in the local basis. And, uh, and so you perform some feedback to bring your system back to the local ground state. And in doing so, uh, you will be recovering some work. So the standard idea is that if you have a bunch of qubits, if they are excited, you apply a pi pulse and they to, to, to flip them to their ground state, and, and uh, they will emit photons in your pulse that will give you some additional energy. And so now you are in the local ground state. Uh, this is still a state uh, from the local eigenbasis, so the interaction Hamiltonian is still zero in this basis. I mean, its expectation value is zero in this basis. Uh, so you can turn on in, turn interactions back on with no adjust energetic cost. So you're back on the right red column. And now that you're here, so uh, you can just couple the interacting system to a cold bath and it will naturally relax to its entangled ground state. So you can start the cycle again. So that's basic uh, depiction of, of our cycle here. And so now um, that's the general idea. Let me show you how we can calculate the interesting, um, the, the quantities which are interesting to characterize the engine's performance. So basically you could work and, and efficiency. So the work, uh, I've told you that work is extracted during the, during the feedback, feedback step, so uh, four here. And this step, so you are in this local excited state L with energy EL and you are basically bringing the, the local system to its ground state zero, zero lock. So the, the, the energy you are able to extract through this procedure is what I call WL down here, and it's simply EL minus E zero lock. So now the question is, what is the probability that you obtain this state uh, during the, the first step, the, the, well, the second step here, the local measurement step? Well, this probability is easily obtained. It's like what I call PL down here, it's just the scalar product, right, with the with the internal ground state, and so that gives you the average uh, work output you can extract per cycle. Uh, so just the sum of PLWL, and if you manipulate that thing a little bit, it's actually fairly uh, uh, easy to see that you can express it quite simply in terms of the expectation value of the uh, local Hamiltonian in the internal ground state minus the energy um, of the, 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 the local ground state uh, energy, right? So that's to work out. Now, uh, the question is, what, what's the fuel for this engine? What, uh, what, how much energy are we supplying it uh, with to, to, to operate? And so the, the fuel of the engine is what is called in the literature the quantum heat. This is the heat that's supplied by the measurement apparatus when you perform these local measurements. Because of course, if you are going to a state of higher energy, it means that energy has to come from somewhere. And so energy conservation tells you that the only, I mean, the only thing that can have supplied energy to the system is the measurement apparatus. And so it's called quantum heat because it's really like of quantum nature. It's, uh, it has no equivalent in, in uh, classical physics. Uh, it's really based on this, a quantum measurement um, paradigm, basically, axial. And so that heat, um, you calculate it the same way, right? Uh, you're in, so the second step here, the local measurement, uh, you start with your system in the, in the entangled ground state, so with energy E0 tilde, and now you end up in some state EL, uh, which has in some state L with energy EL, so the energy that the measurement Apparatus 
has to supply to the system is of course the QL that I've written here, EL minus E0 tilde. And if you do some very simple manipulations, you can see that this is equal to the sum of WL, so the work you will extract during that realization of the cycle and delta, the local entanglement gap. And to interpret that, that it's pretty easy. So since you are measuring in the local eigenbasis, whatever the outcome of your measurement, you will have to overcome that uh, local entanglement gap. So in any case, you will uh, have to pay at least the price delta to basically access the local eigenbasis. And if you get lucky and you get an excited state, then uh, the additional energy you will have to pay is exactly the energy that you will um, you will you will uh, recover in the in the uh, feedback state. So yeah, you can see delta as basically some kind of threshold uh, that uh, energy threshold that you have to pay to access this local again basis and to be able to run that that cycle. And so we do the same thing. We look at what's the probability to 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 uh, what is the probability to obtain this, uh, this state L? We run everything together. And in the end, we find that what's down here, that um, the quantum heat, the average quantum heat can be expressed very simply. It's just the work output plus the local entanglement gap. So you see that to characterize the engine's performance, you actually need only two quantities, which are the work output, which we calculate uh, through this average value here. The, the expectation value of the local Hamiltonian is the entangled ground state and the local entanglement gap, which is uh, usually the challenging part to calculate the local entanglement gap is to calculate the uh, ground state energy. And yeah, and just to uh, through uh, some manipulations, you can also see that the, the quantum heat uh, can be expressed as uh, minus the average value of the interaction energy in the local ground state that tells you that basically the price you have to pay is uh, the price that is necessary to break the interaction in your system. Basically, the entangled ground state. Yeah, the entangled ground state. So yeah, you have to, to break the interaction with this entangled ground state, and that's the price you, 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 you will pay. All right, so here is a little uh, summary of uh, the important uh, notation of the formulas for, for this talk. So yeah, the entangled ground state zero tilde, the local ground state zero log, the energy gap between these states is uh, the local entanglement gap delta. Uh, the work output can be calculated from the expectation value of the local Hamiltonian in the entangled ground state. The quantum heat is uh, just the sum of W and delta. And finally, the efficiency, of course. So the price you have to pay is the quantum heat, what you will recover is the work. So the efficiency is W over Q. And so that simply expressed as W over W plus delta. Um, so, now we have the general theory for a system. So let me show you a few examples, a few special cases we have, uh, we have studied, starting with uh, the strongly interacting many qubit engine. So the, the simplest system you can think of, which has the probabilities we, I have mentioned before. So basically a, a strongly interacting system with an entangled ground state. Um, it's just two couple of qubits via sigma x coupling. So the local Hamiltonian here is just like the one body terms for each qubit, which have transition frequencies omega a and omega b. And they are both coupled together with the interaction Hamiltonian, which is the product of sigma x. That you can check that this satisfies uh, all the properties uh, that I have talked about before. And so down here, I have a picture of the cycle, uh, how the cycle we had imagined worked for, for, for this system. Um, and, and that's very interesting. That would be something that uh, would be doable experimentally, except maybe the, the very strong coupling part, but uh, all the rest is fairly realistic. Um, so you start on the top left with the, uh, the system in the entangled ground state. So the kind of infinity sign here represents interaction. Um, so you perform a local measurement on say qubit A, uh, so you, you only have, we will see later why, but you, you only have to measure one of the qubits actually to know the, the state of both. Um, so if you're unlucky, uh, you end up in, you, you, your reading will be zero. And that means that both A and B are say zero. So they are in their local ground state. You don't have to do anything. You just switch interactions back on and wait for the thing to relax. But if you measure one, 
then it means that both of them are in their excited state. And in this case, you apply five pulses to both of them, and you can recover energy in the pulses, go back to the local ground state, zero, zero. And same as before, you, uh, uh, you switch the interaction back on, and you let the thing relax, and you can start to cycle again. Okay, so uh, it's a fairly simple system. So we have an analytic, so we can find an analytic solution pretty easily. So uh, as I was saying, the entangled ground state zero tilde, it's a linear combination of the phase zero, zero and one, one, which is why you only have to measure one of the qubits to know the state of the second one. Uh, so we have the angles phi and the quantity gamma here, which are all defined down here. And so we can obtain really like analytical analytical formula for every quantity of interest here, the local entanglement gap is here in terms of this gamma. And uh, the work and efficiency have also this fairly simple uh, uh, formula down here. Uh, so here's what it looks like, some plots. So the vertical axis is either, so in blue you have the work per um, uh, in units of the transition frequency omega A plus omega B, and in red you have efficiency. And you see that there is some uh, trade-off here. Uh, so when you are at, at very small coupling, uh, you don't have any work output, but the efficiency is maximum. Uh, and this maximum is one, in one half. And then as you increase the coupling, you have more uh, work output, but the efficiency drops. And so this trade-off you can really see, um, this is uh, in this small inset here, is the efficiency as function of the work output and so you can clearly see the, the trade of it. Yeah, go ahead. What does theta equals to 0 0.5 tells us? Is it uh, um, some kind of maximum bound in this kind of system? Uh, I will come to it in a minute. It's not really like a universal bound. Uh, for me, it's just, I think it's just co coincidental here. Uh, I, I will tell you why. Because, yeah, in other systems, we clearly see that theta can. Be, I mean, even in qubit systems, theta can be higher than uh, one half. I will show you show it a bit later. So yeah, so let's uh, so to follow up on the next question, let's analyze the weak coupling case uh, and see what it tells us. So when when the interaction parameter is much smaller than the qubit's frequencies, in this case, uh, the entangled ground state almost coincides with the local ground state, which is zero zero, and so this means that you will have a vanishingly small probability that uh, your local measurement produces an excited state. So you basically have a work output. Um, and at the same time, since these states almost coincide, of course, their energy are getting closer together. And so you have a very small, uh, the, the entanglement gap also closes. So now if you look at the efficiency, it's W over W plus delta. And I told you it, it goes to one half. Uh, the, Main point is just that for, for in this case, uh, it turns out that the work output and the entanglement gap um, go to zero at the same speed exactly, which is why we have this one half here. But uh, I don't think there is a fundamental reason behind that. Yeah. I have one more question. So uh, you showed us a paper on two qubit engine triad yeah. uh, in one of your slides, initial slides. Yeah. Which one of these regimes is there? A, I mean, is any of these regimes like? No, it's totally different because uh, different we, yeah, we rely on. Uh, so we rely on the entangled ground state, and in their case, they rely on on, uh, on um, a subspace which are uh, entangled, and the energy they recover is the detuning between the two qubits. We don't require any detuning to work here, so the physics is is quite different, and uh, we really have a like. A different Hamiltonian. We have sigma x coupling, they have this uh, um, rotating wave approximation. So it's a different sigma. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really different. And so now uh, in the deep strong coupling regime, uh, the entangled ground state become a maximally entangled state, a bell state. And in this case, it means that uh, basically during half of the cycle's realization, you will obtain an excited state. And so you will be able to extract work. Uh, and the work we you extract is uh, the equal to the transition frequency of, uh, I mean, the sum of the transition frequency of the, the qubits. And so if you obtain that excited state for half of the cycle's realization, it's just omega A, the, the average work is just omega A plus omega B over two. But the problem you have is that 
in this regime, the entanglement gap becomes infinitely large. And so uh, you see like the formula for the efficiency up here. Uh, delta is a denominator, so it means that your uh, efficiency goes to zero. So that's the very simple stuff. So now let's generalize all these to a uh, chain of qubits. So we consider now the local and interaction of up here. So uh, we have just a chain of qubits with the, uh, for simplicity, we choose them to have all the same transition frequency omega. Uh, and so the local Hamiltonian is just the sum of the one qubit terms. And um, we choose a chain with nearest neighbor uh, interactions through sigma x coupling. And uh, for simplicity also, we, we consider the case where you have a um, periodic boundary condition, so it's more like a loop. Uh, and so we would apply the, the same protocol here, measure the qubits in the local basis. So each individual qubit has to be measured. And then the ones which are excited, you flip them, you recover some energy in your poles, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what, it, what I want to point out here is that this Hamiltonian, the total Hamiltonian that we built here, is analogous to what's called the transverse field icing model, uh, so which is basic, which is uh, just Hamiltonian for a, a icing chain, so with nearest neighbor couplings, uh, and some some transverse magnetic field, which will uh, tend to tilt each of the spins here. And so in our case, omega will play the role of that transverse magnetic field, which tends to tilt the the uh, the, the the spins and G is just the usual icing uh, exchange parameter. One thing which is very interesting in this model is that you do have a phase transition when G is equal to omega. So when G is smaller than omega, um, the, the magnetic field dominates. And so the behavior, the, the uh, main behavior is that spins will tend to uh, anti-align the magnetic field and so they will be all parallel and opposite to the magnetic field in that case. So that's what we call the diamet magnetic phase. And when G becomes uh, bigger than omega, then uh, the, the magnetic field does not really play a role anymore. Uh, what is important is that each spins want to be anti-aligned with its neighbor. And that's what we call the, the anti-ferromagnetic uh, phase. So that's what is represented down here. And what is very... Uh, uh, useful for us uh, to have this connection with quantum magnetism is that now we can use the, uh, the theoretical tool from quantum magnetism to solve the model and find uh, uh, the engine's performance. Uh, so uh, this is a very technical, but I will just uh, talk uh, very briefly about how we do that. Uh, the main idea is that you apply what's called the jordan wigner transformation, which is uh, a transformation that will map map your spins onto fermions. Uh, and then through a bogle lyubov I mean, you go to momentum of space and apply a bogle lyubov transformation and you obtain these, um, these uh, quasi-particle operators B and P, which create fermionic uh, particles, quasi-particles. And so your total Hamiltonian in the end can be mapped into this uh, free fermion uh, Hamiltonian, which is very useful for us. Uh, just, I just want to point out that these uh, CPs here, they create, I mean, they are the annihilation creation operators for Jordan Wigner fermions um, in momentum space, so with momentum P. Uh, and yeah, basically, you, you, you can think of Jordan Wigner fermion uh, in position space as basically one fermion uh, is equivalent to one qubit excitation. Uh, and that's in momentum space. And so just for reference, I give you all the, uh, the important points it's for this transformation here, but that's not really the point. And one final thing that I want to emphasize uh, is that the entangled ground state down here, so you see it's a product of uh, over all momenta of some operators. But what is interesting to see is that um, it's a product only of uh, states with um, with an even number of excitations, which is why, so if you remember the uh, two qubit case, you only had to measure, measure one qubit. And here it's the same. You don't have to measure actually all the qubits, but all but one, because you will, uh, once uh, you know that you will always have an even number of excitations. Okay, so now with all these results, we can compute the work and efficiency 
of, of the, the engine. So let me start with the work. Um, here it's equal. So we calculate it by taking the expectation value of the local Hamiltonian in the entangled ground state. And you end up with this fairly simple formula here. Uh, so which is plotted in this density plot here. So the vertical axis is the number of qubits in the chain. The horizontal axis is the ratio of the uh, coupling to, to the transition frequencies. And what we plot here is the work per qubit, so work divided by n. And you see that there is basically no change along the vertical axis, which mean, means that uh, work, the work essentially scales linearly with the number of qubits. That's the first interesting observation. And if you look along the horizontal axis, uh, you see that it's, it's pretty low when you have weak coupling, similarly to the two qubit case, and then it decreases abruptly around G uh, equal omega. So that's the, the black dashed line here, which represents the, um, uh, the phase transition, essentially. And, and so you have a, a somewhat abrupt increase of, uh, of work at this time. Uh, at, at this point, and then it plateaus uh, until its maximum value, which uh, you can't really see from this plot, but it, it's one half. So. so for the efficiency, the behavior is quite different here. So similarly, if you look at the vertical axis, you see that there is not much change, which means that the efficiency is essentially independent of, of the number of qubits. And now if you look at the vertical axis, uh, at the horizontal axis, sorry, uh, you see that it, it's pretty flat. Uh, for g smaller than omega, but it, it increases a little and, and then it peaks right after the phase transition before dropping. So that's what we are, we are going to examine now. So that's that behavior of having a peak of efficiency for g equal omega is quite different from what we observed from uh, the uh, two qubit case. And so to do so, we, uh, we take the thermodynamic limit, so take the number of qubits to infinity. And in that case, we can have an analytical results for uh, the, so the entanglement gap and the local entanglement gap and the work output in terms of uh, um, elliptic intervals, uh, so that the E and K here, uh, it's pretty complicated. I won't uh, dwell into any details here, but you would have to trust me that both of these quantities have vertical tangents for uh, G equal omega. So the derivative becomes infinite at G equal omega. And that uh, produces vertical tangents in both work, obviously, but also in the efficiency. Um, and, and so these vertical tangents uh, correspond to the sharp increases of, of uh, work and efficiency that we notice at the, at the, at the, um, at the critical point. And so you, we see that this, this uh, phase transition kind of messes up with uh, what we had observed, like the nice clean behavior we had observed for the two qubit case. Because now we don't have any clear trade off between work and efficiency. And actually, you find that the maximum efficiency is obtained right after the phase transition, right after you have this sharp increase. And at this point, what is interesting is that at this point, the work output is not zero. And actually, it's somewhat close to its maximum value. So that's uh, quite interesting for the, um, the, the performance of the engine. So let me just show briefly what I was talking about. So clearly, you see that. Uh, around the black dashed lines, you have sharp increase, sharp increase of both work and efficiency. Uh, and so to give you an estimate of uh, how high you can have to go, uh, you can calculate exactly the uh, value of the work output and the efficiency at the critical point, the thermodynamic limit. And so you obtain these results here, um, which are a nice combination of you know, one and five, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> You don't usually see that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. um, and so especially if you look at the efficiency, it's like pi over two minus one, which is more than than half. So you do have like an enhancement of, of uh, efficiency at the critical point. So now another thing I want to discuss are the limit uh, cases to substantiate my remarks about the scaling. So when you are in the weak coupling regime, where G is much smaller than omega, uh, it's quite the work output is just given by this n g squared over eight omega. It's pretty simple, and you clearly see that it's uh, scaling like the number of qubits, and the efficiency goes to one half, so it's also independent on the number of qubits. What is more interesting, so that corresponds to the direct magnetic phase where uh, spins tends to anti-align with the field. Okay, 
Uh, now, if you look at the deep strong coupling limit, so the, the case where G is much bigger than, than omega, uh, the empty ferromagnetic phase, it's more interesting because in that case, uh, the work output has a different behavior depending on whether N is even or odd. Um, and actually you find this discrepancy also in the local entanglement gap. So in the end, the efficiency is, is independent of, of the parity of N, but so that, that, um, that discrepancy in the behavior of, of the volume is very interesting because it's actually due to geometrical frustration. So for people who are not familiar with uh, the magnetism, geometrical frustration is really simple to explain in an anti-ferromagnetic system. Imagine the tri triangle you have down here, and now each spin wants to minimize its uh, interaction energy with all the neighbors. So they all want to be anti-aligned with, uh, with a neighbor, but of course, when you have three spins, it's not possible, right? Um, and so that's what is called frustration. If you would have a square here, they would, all of them could anti-align with the neighbor. It's not possible here. And so this geometrical frustration seemingly gives rise to uh, a small drop of the uh, work, uh, especially for uh, when um, when the number of, of qubits is odd. Uh, and so, yeah, that um, that that um, result on geometric geometrical frustration corresponds to the the horizontal stripes you see on the plot. It's just because you have variations for depending on the parity of n, so that's why you have these horizontal stripes here, and um, you see that it's much more significant in the ferromagnetic phase because of course um, that's uh, that's a, a phenomenon that requires a strong ferromagnetic interaction to take place uh, so that's all i have to say about the qubit systems uh, so let me move to the last part of the talk uh, about oscillator network engines and the idea here so we saw that in the qubit case, uh, you can apply a jordan Wigner transformation to map a qubit chain onto free fermions, basically. So we had essentially fermionic excitations, but now we were wondering uh, what about what, what happens for boson excitation, right? Uh, uh, can, do we have better results? Uh, what, what happens? And so we studied uh, the case of a harmonic oscillator network. So that's the Hamiltonian, which is right here. Um, where so each oscillator has the, his momentum pj and uh, on top of that all of them interact with each other through their positions and the the matrix k so this k j k here um, is the matrix that uh, basically um, so the diagonal elements of the matrix uh, are, are like the frequency of each oscillator but the off diagonal elements represent the interaction between each oscillator and so we, we generalize the engine protocol to do that model. So we have to perform local energy measurement on, on each oscillator. We can turn off interactions with no energetic cost because our Hamiltonian satisfies the condition that we had defined before. And if you find an oscillator in a local excited state, you drop its energy, the energy is transferred to a battery. We can turn interaction back on and we couple the thing to a cool environment so that we could access. In the study. So there, there are uh, analytical results are possible for this model uh, in the general case, which is somewhat interesting, uh, very interesting. Um, and so we, you see that to calculate the extracted work, we have to uh, focus a little bit on the local Hamiltonian. Uh, so the local Hamiltonian has to include the momenta, but also uh, the uh, local. Uh, frequency for, for each oscillator, the natural frequency of each oscillator. And so it just corresponds to a collection of non-interacting harmonic oscillators. So you find the, uh, the local ground state energy is just the sum of all these zero point energies for, for this ground state. And it's inter interesting actually that um, there are uh, uh, so there are uh, known solutions for, for the many body ground state here, the entangled ground state in terms, which are written in terms of the uh, matrix omega, which is the, the matrix square root of K. It's possible because we, uh, we have to consider K as like, um, so what is like positive semi-definite matrix, basically a real matrix symmetric with positive eigenvalues. 
And so, yeah, we have this solution for, for uh, the many body ground state. Uh, and I want, uh, yeah, just, I want to emphasize that X here represents a vector with uh, whose co coordinates are the take all the X states, right? And now that we have all this, we can calculate the local, the, the expectation value for the local Hamiltonian with the Gaussian multidimensional integration uh, that gives us the formal result below. And similarly, we can bring the quantum field down there. So essentially, uh, we have all the ingredients to, to calculate um, uh, the, the performance of the engine. It is, uh, uh, but it, so far, those are very formal and, and uh, not explicit results. Uh, so let's, oh, let's give me an example, a uh, very interesting example, which is, again, just a linear little chain. Um, with nearest neighbor coupling. And in this case, so we can calculate all the quantities we have seen before. And uh, one thing which is uh, very interesting to uh, note is that so most of the energies here that uh, are, are uh, relevant for the thermodynamic characterization of the engine uh, scale like the number of oscillators within the chain, except uh, the expectation value of the, um, of the local Hamiltonian which has this uh, logarithmic term here, uh, which uh, appears uh, this additional logarithmic factor. And so if you put all of that, for example, in the efficiency, what you realize is that uh, when n goes to infinity, the efficiency goes to one. So you have perfect efficiency for, for this engine, for a linear chain engine, which is very interesting. So this logarithmic enhancement here uh, really plays a huge role. Let me show you what it looks like, uh, some plots before concluding. Uh, so these plots, so on the left, you have the work per oscillator and on the right, you have the efficiency of the engine and the different colors uh, represent different dimensions. So in each case here, we are studying uh, cubical lattices. So in one dimension, you just have a chain, in two dimensions, you have a square, in three dimensions, you have a cube. Um, and what we see here, uh, yeah, oh, and I forgot to say the uh, horizontal axis is the number of oscillator on a side. So the total number of oscillator is n to the power d, right? So uh, the blue and green uh, points here represent two and uh, dimension two and three. And we see that uh, in that case, uh, the calculations show that all the energies we had before scale linearly with the number of, of, uh, of oscillators. And that means that we will observe results which are relatively similar to what we had in the Fermi case, namely that the work per oscillator will plateau and the efficiency is independent of n, basically, when you increase the number of oscillators. But uh, the, the one dimensional case is special. You have this logarithmic enhancement. So what you see here is that the work output uh, does not saturate, it continues to grow. And the efficiency will approach unity very slowly because it's logarithmic, but it will. Okay, so with that, I will come to my conclusion. So yeah, we, we proposed a new protocol to extract work from the quantum vacuum uh, using local operations on a medieval system whose ground state is entangled. Um, and so we derived all the relevant quantities uh, using, we, we don't have to, uh, use very involved and complicated calculations and quantities to, to, uh, to evaluate the work output and the efficiency of the engine. So the work output, we saw that it can be deduced from the expectation value of the local Hamiltonian in the many body ground state, while the efficiency is just given by the sum of the work output and uh, of the local entanglement gap, which is the gap between the local ground state energy and the entangled ground state energy. And so usually in most cases, when you can calculate the uh, expectation value for the local Hamiltonian in the ground state and the entangled ground state energy, uh, you basically have all, have all you need to fully characterize the engine. And so I remind you uh, the little cycle we have below. And yeah, we applied our theory to two examples. So the qubit chain engines, which can be mapped to free fermions. And we have used the connection to uh, quantum magnetism to uh, solve the solve the system exactly, and um, this exact solution showed us that uh, you will have 
an enhancement of uh, work and and uh, and uh, efficiency, especially close to uh, because of the trace, close to a critical point because of a phase transition in the magnetic system. And yeah, the scaling uh, is basically that works scales like the number of, of qubits and the efficiency constant. And so now to study uh, bosonic excitations, we uh, consider an oscillator network uh, for which you have analytical results, uh, which can be obtained for any geometry, but we focused on the cubical geometry. In um, one dimension, you have this logarithmic enhancement, which is very interesting, gives you high work output and the efficiency approaches unity when you, you go to the thermodynamic limit. And um, in the cases two, uh, dimension two and three, you have a scaling which is more or less similar to what was observed in the Fermi case. So with that, I conclude and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Etienne. Uh, questions? Yeah, I have two small questions. So can you go to the uh, eta? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, so this eta does like the efficiency doesn't depend on how strong they are coupled? Oh, it does. No, we, yeah, it, will, it does depend, but um, the result at it approaches one uh, when you increase uh, the number of, uh, of uh, oscillators does not depend on, on the coupling. So long as it's not zero. Yes, yeah, so long as it's not zero. And yeah, one thing was that uh, when you talked about qubit chain, so taking n equals to two should reduce to the previous results you have gotten, right? For the two qubit. Yeah, so you're right, but it's kind of tricky because, um, so it's kind of hard to apply the results because if you want a qubit chain with two qubits, you need to have two interactions, you will have to mm -hmm. double the coupling, I think, with respect to the first case. And um, so I don't uh, remember all the details now, but I remember that when we when we take some limits, you know, the strong coupling limit, weak coupling limit, I remember that um, there were, in some cases, like, I think it's the work output uh, in the weak coupling regime, uh, Yes, two is a special case, basically. So it's not just uh, you cannot just apply these results straightforwardly to to the to the uh, to the two qubit case. I mean, it's it's uh, just a mathematical like technicality. That, uh, I see. So I was wondering because so you uh, yeah, I was basically trying to connect and uh, for the two case, you don't have a like a maximal efficiency, yeah. but if you go yeah, there, that's because you know uh, the phase transition becomes so a phase transition. Um, technically speaking, a phase transition uh, only occurs in, in thermodynamic systems, right? Infinitely big systems. So uh, when you don't have a big number of particles, um, you might just miss the, the phase transition, right? So you, you uh, your results become closer and closer to the thermodynamic limit in which you properly have the phase transition uh, as the number of, of qubit increases. It's the same thing is that, um, so the vertical tangent thing that I, I talked about, like this sharp increase of, of uh, work and efficiency, it really only occurs in, in the thermodynamic limit, right? If you take a finite number of, of qubits in the chain, you will have something completely smooth, but it's just that, that you increase it closer and closer to the chain. And when you are n equals to two, you don't see it. So maybe I can, yeah. So if you see here for a very small number of qubits, uh, you see that it's quite, I mean, you don't see the effect of the phase transition here. It starts, I don't know, around here, maybe around 10 qubits. Uh, and same here, you, you seem to have something uh, pretty different from, from um, uh, the large qubit case when you're in, in the small qubit. I, I think one thing which is actually interesting with these plots is that you see that you don't need to have a thermodynamic number of qubits to have something which uh, is similar to what uh, you have 
in a thermodynamic limit. So 10 or 20 qubits are actually very close to the infinite qubit case. So if I were to zoom here, maybe you will see that huge discrepancy. Okay, go back to the efficiency circuit one multi multidimensional oscillators at the end. Yes. So I'm just curious if, uh, so you see as you increase the dimension, the efficiency sort of systematically decreases, right? Is that because uh, the number of qubits grows sort of exponentially Whereas your number of nearest, nearest neighbors does not is that why that's happening? Or? Oh, that's an interesting point. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but that's a very interesting uh, point. Um, No, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Um, we don't have to look into this. Uh, I don't know if it's yeah, it may have something to do with the coordination number. Yeah. yeah. I think you're probably in the. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... No, yeah, you must be right. It must have something to do with that. Uh, I think the... Yeah, the amount of work you're extracting or sort of the energy that goes into entanglement that comes from your coordination. Yeah, there must there must be a relation between the number of things you're interacting with and how much you're entangled with. Yeah, that's, kind of, so, yeah. that's what I yeah. mean. Yeah, that's a good remark. Thank you, Abhishek. Okay, are there any questions on the Zoom or anything in the chat? Nothing in the nothing on the Zoom side. Okay. No. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, just maybe just one comment. One of the things I find fascinating about this work, Etienne, is that we started out playing with these measurement engines and very rapidly got caught up in the physics of quantum magnetism yeah. and bosons and fermions. So, so did that come as a surprise to you? Yeah, no. It's true that. Uh... Actually, yeah, it's very interesting because we, I think for a while, we stayed on this very simple, just two qubit case. Right. And then at some point we said, oh yeah, why not uh, try to, to increase the number of qubits? And then we had like this kind of uh, click in, in our minds. We said, oh yeah, but that's like one mechanism. Oh, and why not try bosonic? And yeah, yeah. One thing which is very interesting about this work is that we can really establish connections uh, uh, with, with um, especially with the quantum material community. And uh, one of our co-authors, uh, Alexei Opev, she was saying actually that one thing which is interesting, typically in the um, quantum magnetism uh, case uh, is that when you have quantum material, um, usually entanglement comes from for free because you have just a large number of stuff, everything, it's a hot mess, everything is entangled together. But people usually don't really care and um, then in this situation, it's like the local measurement part is hard. And comparatively, usually in uh, the like of QED platforms, you are trying to have entanglement, but local measurement is relatively easy. And so here we are kind of trying to bridge that gap between the two communities and maybe in the future, uh, if technology progresses on, on the local measurement part, we are able maybe to bring these two things together. And the fact that in magnetism, we have a lot of entanglement that currently is not used to do anything useful. I was because I mean, when you go to the space plants, and I was expecting some kind of gradient behavior, like something goes like n square, but I didn't see why. Uh, what was that? Was I didn't see here? Do you know? Do you, do you know? I mean, they're like uh, this, this paper by I think Campisi and Pazzi. Yes, I so see what you're talking about. Yes, yeah. yeah. paper yeah. about. Uh, 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 kernel efficiency, which can be approached close to phase transition. Yes. But so, so to comment on that, I think the paper by Campisi and Fazio requires, um, I think you need some pretty specific kind of phase transition, right? And I think that is because they based their whole uh, study on the critical exponents. And I think 
they need one of the critical exponents to be negative, and it's usually not, but in some system it is. So I think it's a pretty exotic uh, phase transitions that are required for their work. Um, yeah, in our case, uh, I don't really know what to yeah. tell you. I guess I mean the, the because I was, because there are like people with the like, idea of just like this. Uh, so they have uh, I saw a recent paper by Jonas Keller where they have like a similar kind of system and they study absorption refrigerator and they see that the refrigeration goes as n squared instead of n when mm -hmm. you increase the number of beams in the IC chain. Is uh, kind of different here, but I think it's a different setup. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't really know because also like maybe it has to do with um, different kinds of phase transition. Because here, for example, we can I mean uh, we do have like a result for the work output at the critical point. We don't have any discontinuity. Uh, we just have this vertical tangent. We can calculate that exactly. So uh, that's. Quite different, I think. Um, also, there, there are uh, other quantities that you might be interested in calculating that there. So, uh, yeah, that was raised by, by one of the referees of our paper. Maybe we should have a look at fluctuations around the critical point of this kind of thing. So we still have some work to do. Okay, I think we're out of time. So let's thank Etienne for the nice talk. I think I'm going to invite you all to lunch at the faculty club if you want to join us to thank Etienne for a nice talk.